good morning. There's something to be said about consistency in a familiar face, because there's a few of you who are like, mm, who's that guy sitting up there? I look a little different than Miss Stephanie, don't I? Right? Miss Stephanie is away today, but she sends her, her love to each and every one of you. So, I have got something I want to share with you that I, I think will be very important to us all, both for us as little kids and big kids behind you. But before we do that, some little birdie told me that someone in our group today has a birthday. Does anybody know whose birthday it might be? Val, is it your birthday? Can we sing happy birthday to you? He's thinking about it. Is it going to be all right? Let's, let's, is there any uh, adults that have birthdays in this morning? Anyone? No, you get to be the only one. All right, can we, can we, can we get a little support? You ain't got to play, just sing with me so I don't make a complete fool out of myself. Ready? Oh, yeah, Mark, get set. It's Val, by the way, when you get to that point. Val, okay? Ready, set, go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Val. Happy birthday to you. All right, very good. Val, how old are you today? Four years old. All the things that are ahead for the four-year-old. All right. Well, we thank you so much for supporting Val today. So look, today as we jump into the, the Bible, and Pastor Dave is going to come and talk to us, but before we do that, I want to ask you a question. Do you think that every single one of us has a purpose in our life? It's a big word, a purpose, right? Something we're, we want to do, something we think we're supposed to do. What do you think? Are you raising your hand or waving to daddy? What do you think? What do you think the purpose is? What's something you want to do? Anything. Be an astronaut? Be a zookeeper? Be a preacher? I don't know about all that. But there's a story, it's actually a true story, about a man named Thomas. Okay? And this might give you a hint. I don't know if you're this far along in school yet, but, we're, but you will get there. What is this right here? A light bulb. A light bulb. Now, what was this designed for? Uh, not a trick question, right? To give light. You see that light bulb right there shining directly? Don't look at it too long. You see that <laughs> great light bulb right there? Did you know there was a man named Thomas that worked really hard for most of his life? He invented all sorts of things, but one of the ones that he is known for most is inventing what we call the light bulb, right? So that you and I don't have to use candles everywhere we go, right? So we can have light when we come into a room. So Thomas believed that this was part of his purpose, right? Now, do you think that Thomas Edison messed up a few times trying to create the light bulb, or do you think he got it right the first time? 999 times? Probably did. Probably did. I would mess up more than, more than that. Trying to, I wouldn't know what I was doing, right? But he messed up, but he kept at it, right? When he messed up 901 times, 902 times, 903 times, he didn't stop. He kept at it because he believed that his purpose was to, to make the light bulb so that you and I, several years later, could see, right? Now, this morning, as Pastor David comes to talk to us, he's going to use a phrase, something like, get up and get busy. Like, it's time to go and do and love Jesus and let our, our, our lives reflect that. So we, we show God's love through our smile and through our obedience and through the ways that we talk to people with kindness, right? All those things are part of our purpose as children of God, right? Now, do you think there will be times when we mess up? When we say things, maybe we weren't so kind this time, or maybe mom or dad told us to do this and we didn't quite do it right this time. Guess what? Big people still do that too, right? Not just little people. But guess what? You and I, because of Jesus and his love and his forgiveness for us, continue to get to try and try again to do it better next time, right? Thomas Edison eventually got it right. And since Thomas Edison, we have continued to improve the light bulb, right? But it's because of his persistence to his purpose 
that we're able to have light like we do today. So I, I share that with you this morning because I believe that each and every one of you, you don't have to be a grown-up to have a purpose, right? Children have great purpose. You can be the light of Jesus to everybody you come in contact simply with just being kind and showing love in every situation, and that's important. Okay? Can we pray? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Dear God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for Val and his birthday. We thank you for the purpose that you have in our lives as we continue to figure out what that is day after day. And sometimes, God, we do mess up. Just like Thomas said, has messed up a few times making the light bulb. Well, we're going to mess up and not be kind sometimes and not choose love sometimes. But we know that you love us anyway and you forgive us when we don't and you help us to do better next time. So I pray that each and every one of these children understand that and that we will indeed choose to follow after you the best we can. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, I got a bag for you before you leave. There you go. You can go back to your seat. You want one? No? Okay. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Here, take one, ma'am, just in case. You're welcome. Might have given me up from there. <laughs> Good morning. morning. I have to confess, uh, as Daniel and I were in the back this morning and we were preparing to come in and join you guys, I said, I feel like we're in kind of Joppa. Do you guys know where Joppa is? Other than in the scripture this morning. Joppa is located on the coastal area on the Mediterranean Sea, and it's a small village. And it was in Joppa that Luke tells us the story that there was this lady named uh, Tabitha or Dorcas. And she was dead. And that's kind of how I felt when I saw you guys this morning. I felt like they sound absolutely exhausted and maybe even kind of dead. So we got to change that. And you guys got to get some energy and some excitement about being in church on Sunday. I told Daniel, I said, thank God we're not like real professionals that feed off the crowd because this morning it's all downhill from here. (laughs) So happy Sunday. Yeah. There we go. Okay, we're leaving Joppa slowly, but we're going to get there. Well, this morning's scripture reading comes to us from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9, and I want to read beginning in verse 36. Now in Joppa, now that you all know where that's at, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas, and she was devoted to good works and acts of charity. And at that time, she became ill and she died. When they had washed her, they laid her in the room upstairs. And since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to Peter with the request, Please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and he went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs and all the widows stood beside him. And they were weeping and they were showing the tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and he prayed. And he turned to the body and he said, Tabitha, get up. And then she opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and he helped her up. And then calling the saints and the widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon a tanner. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, in this story, we have Peter. 
Well, that'd get you awake, right? It was that was planned, by the way. <laughs> Not really. Anyway, we had Peter, and he's about ten miles southeast of Joppa. And uh, he's doing his thing, and he gets this message: Hey, Peter, we need you to come to Joppa, and we need you. But they don't finish the story. They don't tell Peter exactly what they need. They don't say, Peter, we need you to raise Tabitha from the dead. Peter, we need you to speak a good word. Peter, we need you to do somersaults. None of those details are given. We have this small village of Joppa. We have Tabitha who had devoted her life to good works. We have Tabitha who, by social and economic standards, was on the low rung of the ladder. She was making tunics and making supplies for people, whether they were followers of Jesus Christ or not. She was just doing good works. She was doing the best that she knew how to do. And she was reaching people, and she was touching lives. And then one day, the scriptures tell us that she became ill, and she died. And then the folks that she had been helping, the folks gathered around her, did what they knew to be the best thing, and that was they heard about this guy, Peter, who was roughly 10 miles, give or take away, and they said, we need to send someone to get Peter and get him to come here. Talk about faith. So they send two men to go get Peter, and they say, Peter, you got to come. And Scripture says that Peter got up, and he came immediately. He didn't sit back, and he didn't figure out what the best route was on his GPS or his map. He didn't get out his compass. He didn't ask ten other people. He didn't form a committee. Lord knows we Methodists love committees, or at least you used to. We got rid of that nonsense. <laughs> Peter said, we're going to get up and we're going to go because that's what we're called to do. So Peter gets up and he goes to Joppa immediately and he goes upstairs and he sees what is before his eyes. Now can you imagine, because scripture doesn't tell us, but can you imagine what Peter must have felt when he walked in that room? Can you imagine the, the emotions that must have come over Peter walking into the room knowing that you have been summoned to come and you walk into a room and there it is. There is Tabitha laying in the bed. Her body's already been washed. But notice, Scripture doesn't tell us that they prepared the body with oils or any of the fragrances. They just washed the body. And see, I think that's an important detail. I think that tells us a lot about the women that were around Tabitha than anything else because it tells us they had great faith even though they never really verbalized it. They knew deep down inside. They had hope deep down inside. And yet here comes Peter, he's in the room and he looks and she's laying in the bed and she's dead and he must have thought, this is a helpless situation. Why have you called me to be here? I don't have the answer. I really, 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 really love this story because this is the perfect story for Christians and non-Christians on what to do at the death of a loved one because often we don't do good jobs with those things unless it's potlucks and things like that. We don't know exactly what to say or how to go or when to go or when is the appropriate time to do this or that. And the simple answer is yes. Be like Peter. Just get up and go. Because what you said, I almost guarantee you they're not going to remember it anyway. They're not going to look back 50 years from now and say, oh, you're the one that came through the line at the funeral home and you said this or this or that. It's going to be your presence that was the most important thing. So Peter's in the room, and they're showing him the tunics, and they're showing him all that she had done, as if they were to say to Peter, Peter, she was a really good woman. Peter, she did really good ministry and mission here in this community, and she touched lives. Peter, you got to do something, but they never said, Peter, you got to do something. Instead, Peter recalls, and he remembers the story of what he had experienced. He remembers the story of when he was with Jesus and he saw Jesus raise someone from the dead and so he follows and does exactly all that he knows to do and he invites those ladies to get out of the room. He invites them to, to leave the room and he's in the room along with Tabitha. And notice what Peter does. He mimics the moves of Jesus. He kneels down and he begins to pray. <clears throat> and often we'll hear things like, well, I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to say in the prayer when someone is sick or when they're, they're ill or when they're dying. I don't know the exact words to say. And this is a scripture where Peter says that's okay because you don't have to know what to say. You just have to be there. And Peter begins to recall the stories of Jesus. And then he utters the words that he heard Jesus say not long before. And he says, get up, Tabitha. Get up. And her eyes open. 
She sits up in the bed, and the prayer is answered. A miracle took place right there before Peter's eyes. I would dare say that Peter was just as surprised and shocked as the women when Peter opens the door, and he says, hey, here she is. And the joy that filled their souls. And notice what Peter does then. Peter doesn't hang around for the buffet. Peter doesn't hang around for all the well wishes and the good jobs and the pats on the back. Peter slips out. Peter slips out the back door, and Scripture tells us, and we'll look at next week as we continue in the book of Acts, Peter stays with someone else who on that socioeconomic ladder was at the very bottom. He goes to this man's house. As Scripture says, his name was Simon, and he wasn't just a Simon, but he was Simon the Tanner. And a tanner was somebody that was thought of as, as low, working class, unclean. They weren't someone that was going to be in the temple doing ceremonial um, practices. They were someone that dealt with dead animal skins, and because of that, they were unclean. So society said they weren't worthy. Society said they weren't cool enough to hang out with the cool kids. But that's where Peter decides to go next. Now, wrapped up in this story are a lot of good nuggets that I think are important for us today. First and foremost, we have to understand that as followers of Jesus Christ, our job is to do exactly what Peter told Tabitha. Our job is to get up and go. You've heard me say this before, I hope. If not, here it is. Thoughts and prayers do no good if you're not willing to get up off your thoughts and prayers and do something about them. Yesterday at about 10 o'clock, the city council here held an emergency meeting. It was in reference to all the violence that was taking place in the city. And I have to confess, I listened to all of that mess for a good hour before one city council person spoke up. And when they started speaking, I have to confess also, I thought, oh boy, here we go. But then they started talking and I started listening. I was like, you know, they're the only ones that have any common sense on this committee. Because their message was, we don't need to come here with platitudes and we don't need to come here with empty phrases and we don't need to blame this or this. You just need to do something about it. And he made reference to his family. He made reference to his dad and to his mom. And he said, listen, when I was a kid, if I did something wrong, you know what happened? Happy Mother's Day, by the way. He said his mother would snatch a knot in him and then his dad, in his words, would jack him up and would say, hey, boy, don't you do that again. And he knew right then that he'd better stop. He did something. He got up. He put movements behind just words and empty phrases. And he looked at all the fellow folks on the council, and he said, we don't need more promises. We don't need more people saying the city's in a state of emergency or our thoughts and our prayers are with you. We need you to get up and do something about it. And when I heard that, I thought, yes, that is what disciples are supposed to do. Sadly, they also referenced in that audience were pastors, and I thought, how many of those pastors are there? And they're there to issue their appearance so they can be seen and or their thoughts and their prayers, but they'll go back to their churches and they'll do nothing about it. My grandmother used to tell me that if you're not part of the solution, then guess what you're part of? You're part of the problem. So the problem with the church today is too often we're not part of the solution. We're part of the problem. Because we don't do anything. Unless, of course, it's within our walls. Unless it's on our property. Now, we will get up every now and then and we'll go out and do a feel-good service project here or there. But then we come back and we hide. That's not what Scripture calls us to do. That's not what Peter does in this morning's story. He gets up and he goes into this unknown territory. He goes into this place where the rest of society said, Peter, you don't really belong because they're not your people, Peter. Peter, you're too good for Simon the Tanner. Peter, you're too good to walk into this room with Tabitha and these women and these widows. They're not for you, Peter. Peter, you're better than that. But Peter says, no, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go because that's what I saw Christ do. I saw Jesus Christ kneel and ride into the sand before they stoned a woman and they all dropped their stones and they left. Peter, you saw Jesus Christ do things that are countercultural and that everyone would say you're crazy for doing. But Peter said, I'm a follower of that guy and I'm going to go and I'm going to do likewise. And so he goes. He's not afraid. And then when he gets there, it's almost like, okay, I'm here, God, now what? How many of us have found ourselves in that situation? When maybe we followed what God was telling us and we've gone and we get there and we're like, okay, God, you're not talking fast enough because I beat you here. I need you to speak something quick. 
I find myself in that position a lot. We'll get calls, emails, or texts about someone in the hospital or someone that's on their deathbed. And half the time when I'm getting there, thank goodness no one pulls out in front of me because my mind is thinking, okay, what are you going to say when you get there? I remember the very first death that I had as a pastor. And I remember getting the phone call. I was sitting at, I can remember it like it was yesterday. I was sitting at Chick-fil-A with my sister and my brother-in-law, and we, were, we had just sat down to eat. And my phone rings, and so I answer the phone, and they say, hey, um, just wanted you to know so-and-so has just passed away, or we just found out about the passing. And I said, well, where are you at now? And they said, well, we're at so-and-so's house. And I said, well, I'll be there in just a minute. And so I, I could feel my face flushing with just the blood and just the nerves and just the cluelessness in the moment. And I looked at my sister and my brother-in-law and I said, would you guys like an extra sandwich because I've got to go. And they said, where are you going to go? And I said, well, someone has just passed. And I remember leaving the food there and I remember getting in the car <clears throat> and as I was cranking the car, I thought, what are you going to do? You, you've never done this before. You don't know what to say to people in these moments. And so I did what anybody else would do. I picked up the phone and I started calling some friends. I was like, hey, what would you say in these particular moments? And you know, they were all helpless, by the way. None of them helped me. <laughs> because they all said, well, I've never had that situation. My deaths have been kind of more normal. I was like, great. Okay, well, I, and then they want to talk about other stuff. I was like, I don't have time to talk to you about that. I'll call you back later. <laughs> Before I knew it, I was in the driveway. I was like, great, God. I'm here, but I have no clue what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm going to say to bring comfort to this family. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what questions they're going to ask. I don't know what kind of emotional setting I'm going to walk into. God, I need help. <clears throat> and I got out of the car and I went in the house. And there was all the family that was gathered. And we began to have conversation. And I remember sitting there. And gosh, I don't think I left that house until 8 or 9 o'clock that night. Because different family came and they went and we were just talking and, and there were questions that were asked. And when I got ready to leave, the mother of the son that had passed, she came to me and she said, thank you for just being here. And I kind of chuckled and I said, well, that's all I know how to do is just be here. I said, I kind of felt like I was, I was worthless and didn't do anything because I didn't offer you anything. And she said, you offered more than you could ever imagine. And see, I tell you that story because often we feel like we've got to have the right answers. We feel like we've got to know how to respond and act when really all we've got to know how to do is to get up and to go and to be present with people, to be there with them, because those are the things they're going to remember. <clears throat> That's what Peter does in this story. And then when Peter gets there, he's at the bedside and he recalls the stories of Jesus. And I say, that's what our steps, next steps should be. <clears throat> when we show up to these places, whether it's at the death of a saint, whether it's at some sort of tragedy in our community, whether it's at a potluck dinner for Mother's Day, and we find ourselves void of words, then we are to recall the stories that we have lived, the experiences. We think back to what would Jesus do? What has Jesus done in these situations? And then we offer up a prayer I love it because scripture says Peter knelt. He kneels at the side of the bed and he doesn't come up with some elaborate prayer. He doesn't come up with fancy words. He doesn't quote scripture. He says three words, two of which he heard Jesus speak just prior. He speaks those words, I think, in desperation. He speaks those words in prayer. He speaks those words in hopefulness. As he says and he prays those prayers and he puts his faith in Christ Jesus, I think what Peter is teaching us as well is it's not about us. It's not about what you can do when you go. It's not about what you can say when you're present. But it's about what God chooses to do through you because you got up and because you went. Because you showed up, God can use you as a vessel. God can speak through you and say things that you never thought you would say in your life. Many of you remind me of that every single Sunday when you say things that I said during the sermon and I look at you maybe cross-eyed like, I didn't say that. That sounds a lot better than what I think I said, but okay. we got to show up. And Peter prays. And God uses Peter 
to do miraculous things. And see, friends, the good news for us this day is God is still speaking. God is still choosing to work through us. See, the fun thing about God is God doesn't need us, but God chooses us. See, that's a different understanding, isn't it? Because if God needs me, then I feel like there's some exchange. There's some agency there that I can kind of get by with and build myself up because then, well, God needs me, so it must be okay. See, God doesn't need us. God wants us. God chooses us. God chooses you to do God's work. God could snap God's fingers and make everything in the world right and perfect right now. But he doesn't because that's what he, got, he has us for. He has his disciples and his servants who follow him and we're to mimic the love of God and the forgiveness. And God says, go and do, get up. Go, be my witnesses. The problem is too many churches are living in Joppa prior to Peter. Too many churches are just kind of coming to church and we're sitting down and we think the showing up means we show up on Sunday morning so we check the box. I remember in church as a kid in Sunday school we'd have these envelopes. You guys may have had them here, I don't know. Um, but we had envelopes and you could get 100% if you did every one of the things in the check boxes. One of them was bring your Bible. That was, I remember that was 10%. If you studied your Sunday school lesson, that was 30%. If you brought an offering, which I thought was funny because you had an offering envelope, so why would you turn in an envelope without the money? But anyway, that was another 10%. And you see how you just, you build your, and then if you attended preaching after Sunday school, that was another 20%. And I can't remember what the other nonsense check boxes were. But I remember every Sunday it was fun because I checked those boxes and I lied because half the time I didn't bring my Bible. I certainly didn't study my Sunday school lesson. I mean, I was a, I was a kid. I was like, you know, 21 or so. But I didn't <laughs> do those things. We have to be witnesses and get up and go out into the community and sit with the people that no one else wants to sit with. We have to get up and go and be present in the moments that nobody else wants to be present in. And we've got to be willing sometimes to even be honest and vulnerable and say to them, I don't know what I'm doing. I have no clue what to say to you that will take away your pain. And that's okay. Because, see, I believe in a God. I believe in a God that loves you just as much as he loves me. I believe in a God that doesn't need us but wants us. And God has chosen you for something just like God has chosen me for something. And the really cool thing about that is when God has chosen us, he doesn't just leave us. He then gives us everything that we need, just like he did Peter at the bedside. God gives us, he prepares us, he equips us, but we just have to be willing to get up and go. So friends, this morning as we think about this story of Peter, Peter and Joppa, we think about our lives here in this church, in this community, in this town. In the words of the councilman, we don't want to hear any more words. Words, fancy words mean nothing. He said, you've got to speak so the people will understand you. And friends, I think that is a message for the church today. The church needs to go out into the world, into the community, and we need to speak so that the community can understand us. And the best way the community can understand us is by the demonstration and the acts of your love and your kindness. And then your words, your stories. Because some people, when you start talking about Joppa, they're going to be like, I don't know what Joppa is. They'll think it was some figure in Star Wars. That's Joppa, by the way. Not, anyway, we can talk afterwards. But we can say, let me tell you what God has done for me. Let me tell you how I know God is real. And it's not just some figment of our imagination. Because we are witnesses. We have witnessed the Easter story. You've experienced the resurrection love. And now it's our job to go out and be those witnesses in the community. Will you pray with me, please? Gracious and holy God, we give thanks to you for this glorious, wonderful day. God, this day when we got to all open our eyes and take the first breath of the day and say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for this is the day that you have created. And God, we pray, let us rejoice and be glad in it. God, we gather here this morning, and, and God, we pray that we, you would receive our prayers, our words, our songs, that all of this wrapped up together would be our offering to you, dear God. God, because you tell us 
To much who has given, much is expected. And God, you have given us the gift of life today. So many of our sisters and brothers today are waking up and they're in pain, they're hurting. God, so many of our sisters and brothers are waking up at the bedside of loved ones that have passed during the night. And God, yet here we are. So God, we know that we have a responsibility. God, we have a calling. God, to get up and go and share this love with as many people as possible. God, I pray that you would ignite a fire in our soul and our hearts and in our bellies that would get us excited for your gospel. God, I pray that you would, you would remove the scales from our eyes like you did in the story of Saul when he was becoming Paul. God, we pray that you would come into our lives with a jolt of energy so that, God, when we look in the mirror and we just say, God, we're just so tired, you can say, yes, but you're still alive. You're still breathing. You're still walking. God, give us the voice to share our stories. God, we want to be a witness for you and for all that you have done. God, not just stagnant, stale pond water that turns and breeds into mosquitoes and all sorts of other stuff. God, help us to be the voice in the wilderness that cries out your gospel. God, help us to be the voice in this community that cries out and says, enough is enough. Because our God is on the throne. Our God of love and peace and forgiveness and reconciliation. Our God is here to offer something better than you can get in gangs. Something better than you can get with drugs or alcohol or any other vices. Our God offers life and life abundantly. God, give us the voice to speak up and to speak out. God, let our thoughts and our prayers not just be words that we tell ourselves so that we feel good. But God, may they be serious and may they drive us to the point to where our heart breaks for the very things, God, that breaks your hearts. God, may it be that the day when we see you face to face that you may say to us the same words that were said to the Psalms as David, that our hearts are like yours and that we are men and women after your heart, dear God. So God, we ask and we pray now that as we are gathered in this space, that God, that as we prepare to come to this table, that God, that you would speak to us once again, maybe the names, or maybe the faces would cross our minds of those who are not at the table. God, may we remember the people that usually aren't invited into these spaces. God, may we then go out into our communities, to our workplaces, to our schools, to our homes, and may we invite them and say, you are good enough. God does love you. God is choosing you. And there is room for you at this table. God, just as we are bold to receive the elements, just as we are bold to hear you speak to us once again that this is my body and this is my blood that is given to you, God, may we go forth and tell others that this same gift is available to them. So God, we pray now that your spirit, God, will be amongst us, your people. And that, God, that they would be upon this gifts of bread and wine. That, God, that you would make them be for us the body and the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, once again. So that we may get up and go to be witnesses for your gospel in this community and beyond. Fill us, God, with your spirit until our cups overflow. For we pray this in the blessed name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, this is the body of Christ that is broken for you. The cup of which we share is a sharing of the love of God. I invite those who are assisting this morning to come forward, please.
Friends, no matter the wor where the world tells you you're at on their social economic ladder, the church says the ground is level. The church says that at this table, everyone is welcomed. So no matter what you did, no matter what you've done, no matter what you're going to do, no matter what you're thinking at this moment, Christ says that you are enough. Christ says that I choose you this day. So friends, come taste and see once again, or maybe for the first time, that God is good, that you are enough, and then prepare to go forth and be Christ witnesses. Come friends, taste and see. to the cross like love could be broken our savior breathed his last like hell had a moment they laid him down in a grave like hope could be stolen and they covered him up with a stone like it could hold him Jesus is risen he is alive look at the tomb there is hope we can find curse has been lifted we are forgiven he is alive Jesus is risen door of death our God is victorious breaking every stronghold of sin by his blood he restores us triumphant with life in his hands he did it all for us forgiven he is alive Jesus is risen he is alive look at the tomb there is hope we can find curse has been lifted we are forgiven he is alive Jesus is risen this morning, I'm thinking about ways in which we are called to wake up, ways in which we're called to go, be, and do, and just into our community and beyond into our world. 
And that, that fires me up. I hope it does you as well. I think about even this past week, many of you, we were gathered around a, a rundown house right here in South Rocky Mount, participating with peacemakers and building shalom and making a difference in our community. On the 15th, which is next Sunday, we're going to be gathered up there again, the very same house, very same place, finishing that mission that God has set before us and then moving on to what's next. I hope you will come and be a part of that. There's room for everyone. Another thing I want to make, want to make you aware of before the ushers come and, and, and so that we can be thinking about it and participating in is this coming Wednesday night. Many of you know Brian Dubberly, his wife Ellen, the great missions that they and their family are doing in El Salvador. Uh, Brian's going to be here. He's going to blow in and blow out and head back to El Salvador pretty quickly. But he's going to join us Wednesday night right here in our fellowship hall at 6 o'clock. Um, we're going to be having a little Q&A, much like we did with Will Bailey, to learn about what God's doing in that mission. I hope you'll come be a part of that. Dinner's going to be served. If you go on our website, the church's website, fumcrm.org, there's a link there. Click on that. Just let me know that you're coming so I'll make sure there's enough Moe's for you to have. Right? And everybody loves Moe's. But I hope, ultimately, I hope that that will, as we wake up and continue to go and do and be into our community and beyond, that missions and service and just loving Jesus actively will become and continue to be part of our DNA as a church. As we prepare to take up the offering, I'm going to invite our ushers to come this morning. I ask that you give of your time, your talents, and your treasures so that we can continue to do this great mission that's before us. you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire In darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God And all my life you have been All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, it's running after me your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. 
All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will see of the goodness of God I will see of the goodness of God you go forth and continue to sing of the goodness of God. Go forth and be witnesses to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go forth in peace and know this day that God has chosen you to go and love, to forgive, and to comfort. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.